on how the European Union has commissioned various studies to document the pilot of e-buses and transporting infrastructure that truly promotes it. Yes, the purpose of these projects has been to introduce e-buses as part of the urban bus network and to truly build a green mobility segment together. That is what India's next focus is. Which brings us to our next speaker. Please put your hands together as I welcome on stage Ms. Martha Vandenberg. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you the project manager manager at UITP who's mainly dealing in alternative bus projects. Please put your hands together as she steps forward. Good afternoon everyone. Um, it's an honor to stand in front of you today. Um, we've shared a lot of great ideas uh, this morning and in the afternoon session. I'd like to add my contribution and share with you our European experience on electric buses. I'm uh, Marta van den Bech and I represent uh, UITP, International Association of Public Transport. So before I start my presentation, I'd like to ask how many of you are acquainted with the uh, UITP network? A few, a few hands, that's great. Not all of you, so let me tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, UITP stands for Union Internationale de Transport Public, which in French means the uh, International Association of Public Transport. It's the oldest association in Belgium, and uh, it dates back to the 19th century, where uh, when nine operators from two countries uh, uh, teamed up to, to share experience, share knowledge. Um, today we are a few more. Uh, we represent over 1,500 companies from 96 countries and we provide our members with opportunities for advocacy, knowledge and network. So uh, UITP is a, a strong supporter of um, uh, of um, uh, European projects and uh, we participate in many of those. Uh, in one of the projects uh, we conducted a study on the state of the art and future trends of, uh, of uh, urban bus networks. Um, as you can see from this graph, um, it was three years ago, the situation may have changed slightly, but back then the electric buses represented only a little bit above 1% of, of the bus fleets. However, in the future, the PTOs and PTAs expressed their strong interest into developing these, uh, uh, these solutions further and over 40% of the respondents uh, would like to um, go electric in, in, in trust different uh, technologies available. So this graph um, corresponds uh, very well to what is happening now. Um, indeed, the electric bus orders uh, are going very, very high um, in the recent years. Um, and we expect it to uh, grow even further. We've conducted a, a study again on how it develops uh, until 2030. Um, and we can see that uh, the electric uh, buses uh, in 2030 will represent over half of European fleet, um, which does not mean that it will be the solution, it will be complemented with other, um, other uh, technologies. Um, but I'd like to stress that it's not only about their fleet renewal, it's also about shifting the mindset of people and the model shift away from the car towards public transport. We cannot focus only on technology. We have to also change uh, the attitude how people um, use uh, public transport. Um, so the, despite the, the, the great numbers for, for bus orders, um, it doesn't mean that in Europe we've solved all the problems. Um, electric buses are still a um, challenging uh, solution to deploy. And as it has been mentioned already many times today, uh, a high upfront cost remain the, the one of the main uh, problems. Also the more challenging operation since uh, we may lose the flexibility of operating the bus. Um, tenders uh, uh, tend to be uh, a bit more complicated so we have to learn how to uh, procure an electric bus. 
Um, we, of course, do not have any standards uh, today in Europe um, for, for the, for the uh, charging infrastructure, so we cannot say we buy a charger and a vehicle and it's going to work. No, we have to think uh, and uh, probably buy um, a charging station that is uh, distant to, to one of the vehicles. Um, and as well, we have to speak one language. We've noticed that electric sector and energy sector and um, bus sector are two different words and um, stakeholders have problems with speaking about the same thing in one language. So definitely uh, this is something um, that we are working on. Um, one of the ways we try to overcome these problems are European projects uh, co-funded by the European Union. And li I'd like to show you uh, some elements of those uh, that we are involved in in UATP. Um, and hopefully these uh, ideas, these solutions will, uh, will be applicable also for your scenarios. So first of all, the Zeus project, it's uh, the biggest ever uh, European project on electric buses in which we are testing over 60, 70 vehicles um, from which we collect data and these data are used to um, provide guidelines and, and tools for other cities to deploy electric buses. And this is the map. You can see uh, that we are testing uh, the vehicles in, in 10 cities around Europe. There are different technologies tested in different conditions, really to understand what technology works for which scenario. Um, up to now, um, we uh, run uh, many kilometers and uh, overcome uh, 750 tons of CO2. These data come from only seven cities, so uh, we can expect that at the end of the project it's going to be much higher. And uh, the way we develop the tools is kind of a phased approach uh, in four steps. First of all, we want to understand if to deploy electric buses, whether we, um, we are ready for it, if it's going to work, um, create a strategy to, to don't do it ad hoc, but rather in a, in a very wise way to, to think what's going to work for us and then go for it. Then we have to plan it. This is a very long stage and we have to take many factors into account. So, for instance, here we look into financing and funding uh, schemes that are available, also in, in the urban policies um, in, in the uh, operating area. Then we procure, of course, uh, we develop tender structures for electric buses. We are working on, um, on working in the energy providers to, um, to understand each other better. And finally, uh, maintain and operate here, for instance, we are developing um, a training uh, module for drivers, but also for the maintenance staff, who are a very important element in successful operation of electric buses. And um, yeah, getting ready is not only collecting the knowledge, it's also being prepared for unexpected. Here, a um, few things that happened during the um, the ZEUS project, um, the first picture you can see is a gas pipe. First, we just found a pipe that when, when uh, digging a hole uh, for, for a pantograph in Stockholm in Sweden. Um, so we realized that uh, this uh, pipe was never on any plan. We don't know what it is. The construction stopped for a few months. Uh, until we understood that uh, it's actually a non-used uh, gas pipe and we can just take it out. Um, then the pantograph was put in place, which you can see on the next picture, but uh, it violated the uh, snow clearance regulations, um, so it had to be moved further from the pavement. Um, it means a different design. Um, you can see it's quite heavy, the design of this pantograph, so it cost them also more money. So really understanding and planning um, is one thing, but uh, things can happen and we have to be prepared for that too. Um, and also IT uh, communication adjustments. This can take many months and that's absolutely normal. It happened in many cities for us too. 
Um, in terms of uh, strategies, uh, when I mentioned in the phased approach, um, this is an example of a bond city in Germany. Uh, they decided f to go electric, fully electric by 2030. Um, but before they did that, uh, they had conducted many feasibility studies and uh, exchanged a lot of experiences with other cities um, to understand that this is really the, the solution for, for Bonn. Um, so they are replacing the diesel buses, but gradually um, up to uh, 2030 when the whole fleet will be electrified. Uh, we test uh, in 10 cities the buses in the Zeus project. However, we do not look only in these 10 cities. Of course, there are many more vehicles um, available on the, on the European, um, in, the Euro in the European Union uh, at the moment. So we asked also other cities to um, share the data with us, uh, share the experience we collected in the Zeus uh, eBus report. It's already the second edition that was published in October, um, so two months ago. Um, it collects uh, information about over 800 vehicles, um, also some uh, vehicles a catalog of manufacturers that are uh, available on the market, uh, as well as electric system suppliers. Um, this report is available uh, on the Zeus website. So uh, I invite you to, to have a look at it. Uh, unfortunately, I tried to travel light, so I didn't bring many copies. Um, but that's what it looks like. So you have first uh, a global overview per region so to understand uh, where Europe is positioned uh, um, on, the, on the global um, situation. And then we have uh, vehicles per city, uh, catalog of the manufacturers and the last uh, chapter dedicated to electric system suppliers. Another project uh, is Elliptic. It's again an EU funded project uh, that is looking into integration of, uh, of uh, not only electric buses but also electric bikes or scooters into the already exi existing network. We know that we have many uh, electric public transport available already in Europe, such as metro, uh, light rail, etc. Uh, so why don't we use the infrastructure that is there? Um, and for instance, we can de design the line like we did in Barcelona, um, that will go from one station to another, and we will use charging from, uh, from the metro catenary. So in this way, we reduce the cost, but we also increase the energy efficiency. Yet another project, EBSF2, already the second uh, project of um, a European bus system of the future that looks into improving attractiveness of buses. Um, and uh, they do not look specifically into electric buses, um, but uh, develop different innovations that can help uh, urban bus systems. Um, and in this uh, project, we are looking into an indoor bus stop that was developed in Gothenburg um, in electricity project um, and testing the um, user acceptance and, and passenger experience with it. Of course, the, the benefits are quite evident. We drive with a, an electric bus into a building. It's a library at the university, so we don't lose um, heat uh, from the bus, uh, which uh, helps uh, keeping our battery um, on a high level. And, uh, you know, Sweden can get cold, so uh, the passengers don't need to wait outside. We can uh, sit comfortably in a building and wait for the bus to come. Um, but in this study, we, we're looking how um, we can improve the interface with the vehicle and the user, because this is a totally new um, situation um, which can uh, revolutionize the way we interact with the, with the public transport modes. So um, we're testing this, um, this bus, also other bus stops uh, around in Gothenburg. Um, the, the results are not ready yet, but we are seeing from the initial results that the technology works perfectly However, the, um, the, uh, the way perce we perceive the, the buses still needs to be um, a bit adjusted. 
And the last project I'd like to present to you is a short, which tests the fast charging solutions that are interoperable, uh, so that we can use um, the same uh, charging infrastructure for um, for buses, for for utility trucks, or heavy medium duty vehicles. Um, in this way, we will share the cost, so the total cost of ownership goes down. Uh, but also we can, um, this is high power charging solution, we can uh, really talk about scaling up uh, to big fleets. Mm, so there are, there are a few um, use cases um, being developed uh, in, in, ten, in six cities in Europe um, and we are uh, looking into, let's say, the next step of electrification. Uh, however, the, the European projects are not the only activity uh, that UATP is doing uh, to understand and, and help uh, our members f uh, to deploy electric buses. We are also um, uh, working on a statistic set of data. Um, it's a global study from 50 countries. Um, it's a, it uh, collects data from 400 bus operators and should be available uh, around September 2018. And, and in this study, um, we are also taking into account the electric buses um, to understand different factors um, uh, in, in these uh, cities. Um, additionally, we, um, we have already available an e-sort. It's an addendum um, to already existing uh, sort um, tool to uh, measure in a very uh, cost-efficient way the, uh, the fuel consumption. So here we can uh, very easily understand uh, the range of the buses and the energy efficiency. And very quickly, um, because my time is up, uh, trainings, uh, they were developed already three years ago and um, we see uh, they are very, very popular. So. Uh, in 2018, there will be two, t two trainings in Cologne, Marseille. Um, I uh, advise you to book your, your spots uh, quickly if you plan to go because they tend to be sold out. Um, and to inspire you, I'd like to finish my presentation with a video to bring you kind of back to what we start with because we all use public transport at some point uh, of our day uh, as passengers. And we have to keep that in mind. It's not only about the vehicle and technology and, and all the engineering, it's about serving people. And um, that's what we did in this year's project. We uh, brought artists on board of buses um, to bring people closer to the vehicles and, and to show that bus is a nice place to be. So if I can have a video now, please. Thank you. There is also the sound in this video, I promise. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So the, the reason why we're here is because this is a very clean energy bus running mainly electric. I think we should start. Well, I'm walking down this road. No one can carry my load. Made for my back Well, I'm not turning back Well, I'm not going to Jackson I don't have no ticket to Reno Haven't felt like shooting no one yet Each day I do the meter But I'm not turning into Johnny Cash Over and over. Now tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, 
six more videos from this campaign. You can all find them all on YouTube on the UITP YouTube channel. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much and if there are any questions I will be happy to take them. Um, has there been any attempt made at uh, looking at swapping batteries for the buses? Uh, could you repeat your question uh, please? Has, has there been any attempt made on looking for swapping batteries for buses as an alternative to charging them? Uh, I, if I understand your question, is to say uh, ad about other technologies, uh, alternative fuels? No, 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 sw swapping batteries. So swapping yeah. batteries, okay. Um, this solution is not really um, widely investigated in Europe, mainly because of the cost. Um, we think that the, the costs are, of batteries are too high at this moment to, to buy them. Um, extra, you know that the uh, battery is mainly the, what the, makes the electric bus uh, so expensive. Um, so there are some case studies here and there, but it's not a, it's not a general practice at your, in Europe, at least not now. Thank you. Hi, it's a follow-up question. What would be the range of the bus be then? Uh, since you don't have a swappable battery pack. No, we, no, we don't. Um, yeah, I, I understood uh, if we, whether we, we don't have the... No, uh, since you do not have a swappable battery pack, mm -hmm. what is the range of the bus and how long oh. does it take to charge? Oh, it depends. Um, so we are looking into different factors. Um, it uh, depends on the climate, so the temperature. Uh, We've seen in Barcelona that it can go um, up to 50% of, of the battery use, so the auxiliaries can eat the battery very quickly if it's uh, a very strong use of uh, air conditioning. Um, the typology, if a bus have to go, uh, has to go up and down, uh, of course it will be using the battery much faster. Um, and it also depends on the technology. We have, uh, we have different manufacturers uh, in these projects, so uh, I cannot tell you uh, this is the number. There is uh, more or less I can say that the the, the, the average will be for a fuel, fully electric battery bus, the standard one, 12 meters. Um, it will be between 200 and 250 kilometers. But I invite you to, to consult our uh, ZUC bus report where you have um, Per case study, uh, the the amount of uh, kilometers driven per day per per bus. Some buses uh, do not run the full day; they they only go uh, in the peak hours, let's say. So there is, of course, a smaller range in these cases. Excuse me. Thank you. Excuse me. Yeah. Are these buses self-funded or was it on leasing? Uh, the buses were bought in the uh, in the project mostly but there are also some cases of lease uh, it all depends on the on the on the given city um, and in the in the Zeus project uh, there was a choice uh, but if you look outside the project uh, you will see that uh, there are also many cases of leasing uh, any idea what was the period of these leases or what was the residual value taken by these? It, it really depends. Uh, this I cannot answer with, with, a, with a simple range of, of years, unfortunately. Some, some buses are, are leased for a test of two weeks, even two months. Uh, Others are leased for years. I want to know what about the safety features in these buses as India's population is bigger comparative to Europe as well as uh, surge protection systems for the battery operated vehicles. I want to know more about this. So your question is about safety. Yes. Um, there is indeed um, a, a bit of a concern whether it's safe to use uh, battery buses but um, w if you go to a shop and you go through these gates that are uh, uh, scanning the the product or, or, or you carry with you your smartphone probably uh, the effect on on your health is uh, much higher than than using an electric bus um, 
Of course, the question arises in the case of a fire. Um, the press loves uh, these issues uh, when something is happening and we can uh, have sensation uh, and, and publish uh, an article. Uh, so um, there is a lot of um, care taken uh, from our side to, to put a, a right picture in our image. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, that happens that is being destroyed. Um, we have not seen um, many cases of, uh, of very negative uh, situations with the buses, also because we try to f uh, build a good relationship with firefighters from the very beginning. So they are um, trained how to deal in case of a fire. Um, the maintenance staff, uh, if needed, they get uh, certificates uh, to, to maintain the bus. The drivers go, undergo a training um, and they know what to do. So this is a way of preventing actually the problem before it happens. Thank you very uh, much. You talked about city of Bonn uh, replacing all the buses with electric uh, buses. So would uh, trams not have been the cheaper and safer solution because it's a city bus? So replacing the city bus with the trams that would not require any battery charging and it would be a very well-defined path and so safety would also be better. Sorry, I don't hear you and I didn't hear you well either. Okay. <laughs> could, could you so repeat my question, question is city of Bonn, yes, they are replacing Bonn. all the buses, the electric buses. Yes, but 2030 they decided to go fully electric. Yes, so uh, if it would have been replaced by trams, there would not have been a need for battery and you know, maintenance cost, safety would have been better. Was that type of study done for such uh, for that city? Uh, no, I am not aware of that, but uh, I propose to exchange business cards after my presentation and uh, I will provide you with a better answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for all your kind questions. A round of applause for the lady as I once again welcome to him on stage to thank her. And in case any of you would like to ask her more questions, uh, you can definitely do that offline or put up your questions on Twitter with our hashtag. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause as we take this opportunity to thank her on stage once again for her time and for sharing how the European market is truly taking e-buses forward. Thank you, thank you. both of you all. And this is what takes us to our very interesting session, which is on the Government of India's promotion of use of electric vehicles in public transport uh, with the launch of FAME scheme, how the government is truly incentivizing the industry to make investment in electric mobility. And who better than him to chair the panel? Ladies and gentlemen, once again, may I request you to put your hands together as I welcome our panel moderator, Mr. Jaspal Singh, head UITB India office with over 10 years of experience experience in urban transport and management consultancy. He comes with us as an expert on the subject matter of taxi transportation and he's received several awards for all his work. A warm, warm welcome to you. I'd like to request you to please take a seat as I welcome on stage our panelists. Once again, I'd like to welcome the presence of Mr. Neeraj Singhal. We had the opportunity of hearing him a while back. A round of applause as he steps on stage yet again. And along with him, I'd like to welcome Ananda Rao, Executive Director, ASRTU. May I request all of you to please put your hands together for Mr. O.P. Agarwal, CEO, WRI India. This is the finale session. A little more energy, please. We're talking about New Age India. I'd like to welcome Mr. Rama Harinath K, Senior Director, New Initiator, Zola. Sir, that's what I use every day. A warm welcome to Mr. Chinmay Pandit, Head Electric Mobility, KPIT. A round of applause as I invite on stage all our panelists. And once again, about 40 minutes discussion time, we'd like to have a couple of questions post that. Once again, I'd like to urge all of you to please put up your comments uh, on Twitter so that the world can know what we're discussing right here. Over to you, sir. So, uh, thank you, everyone. And I think you are the brave audience because you are staying till the last session of the day. So, <laughs> I must compliment you. But it's a very interesting session we have, and uh, we are really thankful for the eminent uh, panelists we have. And I don't think we, I need to introduce them because people know them uh, very well. And I really thanks OP sir, Anand sir, to be here, uh, you know, taking out time and present. So idea is, uh, you know, India is talking about electric buses. India is looking, India is very ambitious. So we see presentation saying by 2013, all electric vehicle and all. 
So China can be one of the role model for us, saying that they can implement uh, a city of you know, 15,000 buses in one year. Or we can see the example of Europe, and that was the purpose uh, we want to highlight, where it's still going at a slow pace. I, I'll not say a slow pace, but a systematic approach. So uh, you know, the, the purpose of this panel is to understand uh, how India should go forward. So there is a FAME scheme. Uh, which was recently invited proposal from all the STUs, and most of the STUs has submitted their proposal. They want to buy 140 buses or 50 buses or 200 buses, so they have submitted the proposal. But will it work in that way? I, I really want to uh, know from the you know from the panel, and also uh, how the charging infrastructure should be addressed. We have an excellent presentation just before uh, this panel about the charging infrastructure. There is a lot of emphasis on public charging infrastructure. So Ola has already done a Nagpur pilot and working on that. And uh, you must be facing a lot of uh, challenges or a lot of experience, I would say. So how would it need to be taken? So I'll, I'll one by one, I request uh, you know, the, to share your view. So I'll start with Opi, sir, because uh, I think uh, he's the pioneer for national urban transport policy. And uh, you can share view, sir, how India should move forward in this area, how we should uh, adopt electrification, or whether we need really electrification of uh, public transport, or we need public transport. So how India should move forward uh, in this area, sir. Thanks, Jaspal. Uh, I think coming to the question of whether we need electrification of transport, I think it's a very, very definite yes something we should do for multiple reasons, you know, whether it's the air quality, whether it's our dependence on uh, crude oil coming with prices which are highly vulnerable. So our energy security issues are also important mm -hmm. for us to move towards uh, electric mobility. I, for one, am also convinced that we should move towards total electrification of transport, but obviously that will not happen uh, immediately. Uh, I don't expect it to also happen by 2030. It will probably take a lot longer. Uh, you'll be able to tell us how long it takes to set up <laughs> all the charging infrastructure if everything is to... Now, I think the key issue is what do we want or where do we want to start? I think that seeding of the market so that there is a certain degree of comfort amongst manufacturers, amongst consumers, that electric vehicles are actually available and I will be able to charge my vehicle when I need to. That comfort needs a certain seeding of the market. And which is the right market for this seeding to happen? The good thing about public transport is electric buses are visible all over the city. Maybe a lot of economies of scale in terms of charging, etc., can uh, also be achieved through looking at uh, public buses being electrified. The only concern I have about electric buses is a normal bus costs about 30 to 35 lakhs. Yeah. But an electric bus costs about 2 crores, if I'm not wrong. And most state transport corporations and most public bus operators are hard up for money. That's we are desperate to have more buses on the road. So this is where I find a bit of a you know, uh, trade-off. We need more buses, but if each bus is going to cost about five or six times more than how do we find the money for this. That is the only concern. Otherwise, at some point of time, definitely we need to have uh, electric mobility. Now, how do we go ahead on this? You know, what my concern is, at this point of time, a lot of very good statements are being made. But how are these statements translating into what can be made operational on the ground? Yes. And that's not going to be easy. There are many players who have to come together, who have to work together, uh, players who've never worked together in the past. For example, the electricity industry and the auto manufacturing industry have never worked together. How do you get to know each other? Yeah. How do you get to work together? I think these are some of the challenges and some work on really creating a systematic operating plan or a roadmap for how we're going to do it is really required. I think that is what is missing today. So uh, I'll just take one more question, sir, from you. So you rightly said uh, there is a you know, scarcity of money, there is a scarcity of investment, and whether you should buy a 2 crore rupees electric bus or you should buy 10 buses for the city. So that's a key challenge. And in that, I see there is always a role for the private player to, to participate and come forward uh, 
like Ola is investing in this space and there are other players which are interested. So what do you think from the, because uh, you uh, created this national urban transport policy and the focus was to move people, you know, so it was to how to move people. So I think if government need to go for the second level, how you see the private participation will play a bigger role in electrification of public transport? See, I think the private sector really needs to come into operating buses. And what I've seen is most cities where you've had strong state transport corporations already in place, there the tendency has been to continue with those state transport corporations. But cities which have not had a state transport corporation providing services, they've tended to bring in the private sector more strongly. So I think the role of the private sector in providing services is very important. Uh, what also, where it needs to be distinguished from the kind of blue line buses that Delhi had, was you have a public agency determining the routes, a public agency determining the schedules, and then contracting with the private parties for operating as per those schedules. So that is the model that should really be emerging. Now even if you get a private operator, and the private operator has to get the electric bus, the cost of the electric bus is still an issue. Mm. Now, I don't know where the industry stands in terms of if the number of orders placed are high, will that help reduce the cost of the electric bus? You know, that, that's something that is quite likely to happen. But how fast that will happen, when that will happen, uh, these are some issues that are bothering me in my mind. Long term, I have no doubt that all passenger transport or in fact even freight transport as far as possible should to move to electric. Thank you, sir. So from this, I'll uh, go to Anand Rao, sir, because he's representing all the state transport undertaking, more than 150,000 buses and uh, carrying 70 million passenger, which is like three times of railway. So, sir, uh, STUs are playing a big role. They are uh, carrying so many passenger. And uh, now with the fame scheme coming in for electric buses, uh, do you think STUs are ready now to straight away go for electric bus procurement and deployment of these buses? And how, from ASRT point of view, think how we should move forward in this area? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I see a couple of my active uh, STU participation here, I could see from Himachal Pradesh. In fact, uh, I would be proud to say that they are the pioneers who first uh, really staged the uh, moment of electric mobility in India at the instance of the Supreme Court, I would say, if it is correct. Uh, again, congratulations. I think you have already put uh, about 25 vehicles on road. Uh, that is the first funding that came up from the DHI. Number two is the BEST, which has recently launched an electric bus also in Mumbai. I don't know if some of the representatives are here or not. I can also see some representations from Karnataka and others. As you said, I could also see from Volvo and industry representatives here. Coming back to STU's uh, role, sir, uh, I think uh, the day uh, is not very far when we can say that, in, in fact, I had interaction with some of the CEOs of these corporations and the commuters and the industry. What they say today, as you know, is uh, you are comparing a bus of 35 lakhs to one crore or uh, two crore of electric bus. Now we should understand what the commuter needs, whether he wants a clean, noiseless, efficient, and a bus which can compare to the cost of operation of a diesel or a CNG bus. In fact, we made a recent uh, tender for on a private hiring model, on a PPP model like how we operate Volvo, Scania, Mercedes-Benz, and other buses on intercity and city roads. We were so much astonished. In fact, I can share this with you also to the audience. Uh, the cost of operation of a Volvo bus to that of the cost of operation of an electric bus is not much of a difference. On a 12-meter bus, what we could see is uh, 83 rupees of diesel bus cost per kilometer of operation. And the same uh, when it comes to electric buses, 83.41. So it is hardly 4 to 5 paise difference in cost per kilometer of, of of operation of electric buses. I don't know, you may differ. I have the answers to this also. The reason being, there are no moving parts, there is no maintenance. As all of us know, the cost of diesel today is anywhere around 56 to 60 or 65, depending on the state taxes. Now the cost of electricity, you may all differ, and you may be astonished also to know from the Himachal 
that they are ge getting electricity at as low as a cost of 5 rupees per unit. Am I right? Right. There are other states which are getting cost of electricity at the cost of almost 8 to 10 rupees. And we are talking of 1.5 kilowatt hour per kilometer to some of the industry. If Chinmay can correct me if I'm wrong. So this is the cost of charging. So the major cost advantage is on the fuel, which will be electricity here, which will be diesel or CNG there. Then the cost of maintenance, the life of the bus. All this will add to the advantage of the electric bus. The best and most interesting above all is the convenience, the comfort. It is much better than any of our super segment. I'm not commenting, sorry, Mr. Sridhar, if I'm not commenting personally on Volvo or Scania, I know you are from Volvo. It will be equal or even better than the quality of these super premium buses we have been seeing in Indian roads today. So what the commuter wants, it is almost the same cost and he doesn't may, um, mind to pay even if it is 5 to 10 rupees more per kilometer. So this is where we are. Sir, I think most of the SQs on the invitation of the DHI for funding, the latest scheme has been very encouraging. The government of India has been given a very good scheme to the STUs. And at least I have seen six proposals from the states like Maharashtra, Himachal is already there, UP is there, Karnataka is there, and six states have already come in in the order of 50 to 150 buses. So I think it is going to take up. Now the challenge is, I don't know if the industry is here or not, whether they will be able to de deliver the requirement of these buses. So this is where we are. I think all these cities, more than 2 million population could straight away jump into this scheme and take the benefit of it. And 30th November was the last date. Already we have got a lot of proposals and I, I don't know if DHI can concur to this. They have got a lot of demand from the cities already. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, sir. Really, I mean, you really said the point that uh, the, the price is not much of a difference. So it's more about uh, how to move forward in this area. And regarding, you know, sir, the point uh, which Martha just presented in, in, in her presentation about the capacity building, training, uh, how to equip the maintenance staff as well as the driver. So any plan from ASRTU side to support uh, STUs and how you think that STU should work in that area of capacity building? Yeah, that is a very interesting area which probably the STUs or we have not thought of. Capacity building is one important area. Probably we'll have to build up that uh, strength in uh, STUs and with us. As Sir has pointed out, the charging infrastructure is a very important thing. Yes. All these days we were talking of mechanical spare parts, fuel, oil, filter, everything. Now we have to talk of electricity and we don't need mechanical engineers, we may need electric and electronics engineers in future. Yes. So there will be a phenomenal change. I was at the ACMA and the CM meeting. In fact, the industry was talking of this concern. What about the industry? We have been there for 50 years or more than 10 decades, I would say. And all of a sudden there will be a change and phenomenal change. There will be no requirement of spare parts. There will be no requirement of fuel or oil no moving parts, what happens to the industry, what happens to the labor-oriented in industry. These are some questions. Yes. But, However, as Sir has rightly pointed out, we have to gear up to our charging infrastructure requirements and competence and the capacity building. Probably, I think, uh, we have to look and strengthen that. We are not still geared up for that. Okay. Thank you, Sir. So uh, from this, uh, you know, I, I'll take opportunity to speak to Rama because uh, you have uh, your hand full with the electric vehicle operation. And I was recently in one of the events where the SoftBank said that the Ola will be the EV company in India. You know, so they, they want to make you a pioneer in this area as well as, you know, leadership role. So, uh, you know, can you share more about the Nagpur experience, how you are, uh, what are the challenges you are facing, what are the support you are looking from the government authority, and even, you know, like Sir mentioned, charging infrastructure, how it can be integrated. Uh, for, from the operator point of view, from the private operator point of view. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jaspal. So, um, if all of you are not aware of uh, what we are trying in Nagpur, let me just briefly tell you about uh, what we have done in Nagpur. Uh, we launched about 200 vehicles uh, around May this year. Uh, it's about seven months of experience. Uh, vehicle across categories, autos, e-rigs, cars. And uh, we've done more than We've served more than 40,000 customers. We've done more than a lakh trips, uh, more than six and a half lakh kilometers. And uh, all this in the last seven months. We have about four charging stations over there. 
and we are piloting and experimenting with different types of charging. Uh, we are doing fast charging, slow charging, swapping. For us, this is more like a test bed to understand the ecosystem, to understand what the nuances of running a business of this, which is dependent on electric mobility. And uh, the whole pilot was more get up for that. It's been a very good learning experience for us. We've, we've, we've been gathering data every day from a charging standpoint, from a fleet operation standpoint, from a maintenance standpoint, uh, from a user standpoint, both from our driver partners as well as customers. There have been varied experiences that have been shared with us. Um, to give you an understanding, fleet operations typically needs something around 200 to 250 kilometers per day. Uh, I'm talking in terms of cars. Currently, most of the cars run in the range of 75 to 100 kilometers, depending on various factors like ambient temperature and things like that. So we need to understand or come out with some creative solutions as to how do I quickly ensure that the vehicle is back on the road. What we need to understand is more the kilometers that a driver partner runs, more income they have, which becomes a very critical factor from a sustainability standpoint of this kind of model. We, the other big important factors are the way to probably one big learning we had is the way to view electric vehicle is you need to have a much more integrated and system approach to electric vehicles. To give you an understanding, in diesel vehicles, ambient temperature had no influence on the range or the number of kilometers a vehicle runs. We've observed anywhere in the range of 25 to 35% difference in the range a vehicle can run between the summer of Nagpur and the winter of Nagpur. That can have a huge impact from a fleet operation standpoint. There have been enough studies done which show that driver behavior, driver pattern, uh, driving pattern can have a 15 to 20% difference in the route range that you can have. Unlike in the systems of the past, we are talking of a much more integrated view that you need to have if you want to run electric vehicles. Factors like temperature, driver pattern, driving pattern, traffic, which this is where probably the connected car mix starts making more and more sense because if you see traffic one way, one side of the, uh, one direction of the route, how do you plan for it? Because you also need to plan your network of charging infrastructure over there. How do you plan for your charging infrastructure for a whole city? Because what everyone wants to minimize whether it's bus operations or cab operations or anyone is dead kilometers. That is number of kilometers you drive back to a charging, charging station to refuel and go back on the road. Things like loading capacity. One of the big challenges we all face when you're running fleets is that you're typically loaded above 100 percent on one direction of the route and far lower in the reverse direction of the route. That's, that's the nature. I mean, that's how the peak traffics behave. How do you factor for things like that? These are issues which we did not think so much about when we are running a diesel vehicle or a, you know, ice vehicle. These kind of issues play a very critical role when you're trying to run an electric vehicle. And in that context, if we don't think of these kind of things, how successful your experiment or your fleet operations can be, can vary vastly on that. And which is what we, it's a big learning for us. We are also trying to now understand how to design a complete ecosystem to run an electric vehicle operations, which is very different from the way we run currently in many ways. So, you know, now I would say like Ola is in the complete value chain. So recently you launched Ola Paddle. So I would say from cycle to all the way up to the premium car and even the shuttle also. But can we have in future Ola e-buses or something like that? You know, a new category saying, okay, we will manage the, the bus fleet of the city or we will uh, provide the technology. Because now, like you rightly point out, the, the crucial things are the data. You know, so for electric vehicle, it's not the operation. It's how well you collect the data and how you process the data for the operation. So can we see in future Ola e-buses or? So the larger vision we have is mobility for a billion Indians. I think we view ourselves 
us as a mobility partner. And our role might be different in different categories. And we are more than happy to participate and to help in, even in bus operations. I think worldwide it's proven that bus is the backbone of mobility for any city. And I think that's a place where we definitely want to be there, of course, given the right opportunity. OK, thank you. <laughs> so uh, from this, you know, from Rama, Rama highlighted the issue of the charging infra, you know, how it is very crucial for the city. And you just made a presentation on public infrastructure for charging. And you pointed out how in China, when they unregulated the sector, the, the sector just boomed. You know, not only the charging infrastructure, but the private vehicle and the electric vehicle sale. So in India, I think the recently government took some decision where they are saying power utility should not have the monopoly for installing the charging infra. So government is thinking in that direction. But do you think what, what more is required to build up and create the private participation in the charging infrastructure space? So firstly means we all know that the network operators will be different than the discoms. So government needs to rationalize some policies for where in the, these network charging network operators or infrastructure operators get some preferential treatment in taking the getting the power and then reselling it to the diff, through their charging station. Like Delhi came up with a policy that uh, the discoms will ne need to provide the uh, electricity to charging infrastructure at five rupees per unit, and the charging infrastructure needs to sell it at five rupees sixty pesos. So that does not make any business sense. Even the discoms are telling that they can't sell the power at 5 rupees per unit. They, their cost of power is 5 rupees 60 percent. So means government needs to intervene and they need to see that how, like in the solar also, you see how the solar price was 18 rupees per, 18 rupees per unit in the early days, then government rationalized it, then government subsidized it. Later on, when it took up the scale, it came down. So government needs to make some policy within respect to these charging stations. Like secondly, government needs to also work with the local authorities so from where the space will come. Mostly space in the cities with local municipal authorities where they can allow or license that, okay, you can install the charging stations here. So means that is also required from the government stand of, um, point of stand. Thirdly, in the Karnataka policy, I had recently heard that they are allowing, giving some subsidies for initially setting up of charging infrastructure. The main point is that what will come first? Charging infrastructure will come first or the cars will come first. So if you will see the data, it is very evident that the charging infrastructure will, should come first. Okay. The charging infrastructure can stand idle, but the cars will can't stand idle. So the government needs to give some push on the maybe in form of incentives or maybe in some direct or indirect ways so that the charging infrastructure is developed by the time because there is a high correlation. There is a clear cut data to prove that the number of charging stations, the more number of charging stations, the more, num more growth of electrical vehicles. So I have a data which I can provide later on, which is that shows the correlation between 30, well, one charging station for, for every 30 cars, one charging station for every 15 cars, and one charging station for, a, for every five cars, how it differs. Then there is also a very strong data and evidence available from m most of the few of the metro cities like uh, Netherlands and uh, also from China, also from Norway, which clearly states the mix of slow charging and the fast chargers, means AC chargers and DC chargers. Like in Norway, we have more than 50% DC chargers, fast chargers, and rest are normal AC chargers. So the percentage of electrical vehicles, the electrical vehicles out of total vehicles in Norway is 30%. Whereas the same type of statistics is available for Netherlands also, Amsterdam also. But the thing is they have very small percentage of fast chargers and very large per share of yes. normal chargers. The share of total vehicle, electrical vehicles out of total uh, uh, automobile, I mean cars market is below, means between 5 to 10 percent only. So there are, these are some of the learnings which is already available and I think government should take care in their formulation of these policies because fast chargers will cost a lot also. It will not be easy and that's not only about fast chargers. When you are going to install these chargers, you require a lot of power also. 
So means you need to set up the distribution network also like the same, and you need to increase the grid system also accordingly. Because if we are what we are talking of, it will increase the power requirement of every municipality or every area to a huge extent. So yeah. government has lot to do on their part itself and let these charging stations be given to the private operators. If you see the or more examples like MTNL, BSNL, everybody knows they are the first movers in the industry. But when the Airtel, Vodafone come, now you see the MTNL and BSNL fit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So the, now I'll come to Chinmay, you know. So you heard the OP sir pointing out the cost of the bus, uh, you know, how to bring down the cost of the bus. And being from the industry, you are developing the technology and you are trying to, uh, you did the retrofitment also. Morning, uh, somebody mentioned about the KPIT bus which is running in parliament. And now you're going for full electric. So what according to you, what according from the industry or the manufacturer or, you know, the player which are working on the technology, how to bring down the cost? Some examples were that you can remove the battery, you can, you know, create a different model. But what from the industry side can be the quick solution to go forward and uh, what would be the approach followed by the operators? Sure. Thank you, Jaspar. Uh, so I'll just give a quick introduction of the company before I go uh, answer the question. Um, KPIT is the company which, which, was, which provided the technology to uh, the bus which was inaugurated by the Prime Minister at the Parliament about two years ago. Since then, um, our journey has been to create a technology which is designed in India, which, is, which works in India, and also which, uh, you know, which will come in new vehicles, because I think there's a fundamental shortage of buses. So you know, we said, instead of retrofitting what we already have, it makes more sense to have more buses coming in first. So that's, what we, that's, the, that's the journey we have taken. I think, um, Jaspal, to your question, the price of the bus has to come down. Uh, you know, a two crore bus, right, is uh, is exorbitant, and I think it has to come down. It has to come down not by a percentage, but by a fraction. Uh, so I think that's a given. Having said that, let's also recognize that electric buses, the capex of the electric bus, will never be similar to a capex of a diesel bus. There will be no electric bus available at a 30 lakh rupee price point because when you buy electric bus, you buy a battery. When you buy a battery, it's like buying diesel for the next seven years today. So you will never have that uh, you know, kind of uh, parity, per se. I think the real play, which is what uh, Mr. Rao, Anand Rao talked about, is to look at a per kilometer cost. And there, you should be targeting a price point which is very close, if ideally better than a diesel vehicle cost. Ignoring the cost of pollution, ignoring the cost of health, all of that ignored, right? The cost of a diesel bus and electric bus should be very close, if not better. We have done, we have taken a lot of steps to get there. We have a clear line of sight where we will be between 15, 15 to 18 percent more expensive than a diesel bus today. And I think as the market grows up and as the competition picks up, that, you know, the, the delta will shrink. Now, when you talk about the comparison and say 10, 15, 20 percent, there are three, four levers which one has to play. One is to understand and pick the right size of battery. Now, there are three uh, extreme scenarios, well, two extreme scenarios people talk about. Basically, first thing is what China has done, is basically if you're going to run 200 kilometers in a day, have a 250 kilometer battery and be done with it. Now, what happens is, very likely, and it has happened in China, you carry the battery and you carry less people because that battery load is what actually drags down the vehicle. And there's the other extreme which is being talked about as a swapping, saying that you change it at a very high frequency. Now, there are operational issues on that side. Uh, as a company, what we are saying is that you need to have anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of your daily run in your battery. And the remaining battery or remaining charging is the top-up charging which you run it on route when you have shift change, etc., etc. So that way you shrink the battery size, but you don't really create very high operational complexity, which is, which is found in the oper uh, battery swapping side. The second thing which happens is that to what you know, Ram talked about was you really have to run a very tight operational show. So having professional operation of these buses is extremely important, more important than having what you, what you had when you had a diesel vehicle. And from that point of view, having the data made available from the bus is something which we will definitely provide. But then the 
operators, be it private or public, will really have to you know, kind of rise to the level where you can really make that asset sweat a lot. So that's the second piece uh, which is very important. And I think the third piece is going to be around the cost of electricity. Now, one thing one should, one should keep in mind is that most of these buses will take power at night. There are already cities in the country where there is an oversupply, or rather, the demand shrinks in the city at night significantly. And when I say night, I'm talking about 10 o'clock at night, from 10 o'clock to about 5 o'clock in the morning. So you have a situation where the grid is underutilized. When you're talking about underutilized grids, there is a reasonable case to ask for a significantly dropped cost for the nighttime charging. That is one piece. Now, the other important part of this whole equation is the cost or the interest cost, because you know the government is not going to throw subsidy forever. I think you know one has to all recognize that. So if you don't have the government throwing subsidy and making the bus cheaper, one should one needs to identify the right interest cost so that the overall, you know, the burden, the financial burden comes down. And there are a lot of green funds and there are a lot of interested companies who are coming into, into play. Last week, IFC had a conference where they talked about providing really, really low cost funds around, you know, for such green purposes. I think all of these things coming together really makes electric viable in a country like ours. And what about you, according, you know, according to you, what, is, what should be the optimal fleet size? For example, if a city placing an order. Sure. Because if you see in Europe, uh, they are not going for hundreds yeah. or 200 number in yeah. one go. Yeah. They are buying the buses, they are running the pilots. Sure. After sure. a successful pilot, they are taking a big order. So should yeah. India go for that approach? Yeah. Or yeah. should we say, like China, you know, 5,000 buses in one month? Yeah. Or yeah. that kind of approach? What yeah. according, I mean, what manufacturers are comfortable sure. with? So, you know, um, as an industry, more we sell, the better, right? But uh, I think one has to be realistic about this. Um, the, you know, nobody, you know, I don't think it's sensible to expect anybody to buy 1,000, 2,000 buses on day one. I don't think that will ever happen. But from a pricing point of view, having a decent number coming out is extremely important. Otherwise, you know, all the aggressive pricing is only on the paper. When you place an order for two buses, you pay a lot. So I, you know, what we, we have been suggesting is that one needs to look at an order of between 100 to 500, deployed over one year or maybe a year and a half. So the deployment can be staggered, but the order size needs to be in this volume so that it really starts becoming sensible so that you can put a whole supply chain in place and really shrink the cost. Thank you. So I'll come to Opie, sir, you know, before opening the discussion for the people for asking a question. You work uh, from the ministry side and you have seen all the city. And you know, all cities are very different. The requirements are very different. The geographic locations, the climate, everything is very different. Do you think like uh, the model which EESL done, like buying 10,000 cars in one go and distributing it to different city, should we replicate that model for buses? Or you think let, let the city decide as per their requirement uh, to go for? I mean, what should be the optimal way? Actually, as we were discussing, the thought that crossed my mind is whether ASRTU can do this for all the STUs. <laughs> but uh, honestly, I, it's, it's difficult for me to give an answer to that because the question you asked is uh, very right. You know, what is an economic order quantity today? And, uh, you said you can't get a thousand buses in one day, but it will start small. My guess is most STUs will start with smaller numbers get used to it. So uh, I'm not sure whether buying them in one go through ASRTU or somebody would make as much sense as EESL picking it up for. EESL has got it mostly for government uh, yeah. vehicles. But what certainly, I mean the one point I would certainly like to fully endorse the point that you made is it's not about the cost of this or cost of that. It's really more about the cost differential between electric vehicles and the competitors. Now, China did go in for differential pricing of electricity. And uh, if you have off-peak times and you have a reduced price for electricity during off-peak times, it's also good for the plant. Yes. The plant load factor sort of uh, evens out and that's a much better thing to happen. So that really calls for some kind of smart metering so that charging stations or uh, people who run a charging business can look at uh, 
when they would like to charge their batteries. That is, I think, something which should be given a strong push from a policy perspective. But uh, I really don't have an answer to whether we should do bulk <laughs> buying for buses yet. No, it's, it's, there are a lot of unanswered questions. I think that's, the, that's a forum to just raise these questions so that we can find the answer, we can discuss uh, with people. So last question to Anand Rao, sir, before we open the panel, you know, the point. I mean, uh, what Rama just pointed out, the importance of data, you know, importance of learning of experience. And you rightly pointed out Himachal is the first one to launch the electric buses. Mumbai has launched it and other cities are following it up. Uh, I think ASRU is the right body or right platform to bring uh, the knowledge from these cities, not only from the public side, but also, you know, I feel Ola can also partner with that and sharing their experience and knowledge together so that it can be disseminated with the other member. I mean, uh, I just want to take your view on that. Uh, I think uh, it's a good question, I would say. All these years we used to have a parallel lines between a public transport and a private or we did not even think of a private and public partnership for long. Uh, as we see, as the days go by, we have seen w the delivery is important. So, in fact, uh, the SQs have understood that they are meant for service, so serving the people. They are not meant to maintain the buses, uh, change the tires, procurement, four lot of things which is not our subject. We are meant to give service to the commuters. That's our basic uh, objective. So having seen this and experienced this, we are open to this idea. With this idea, we started on the PPP model with the STUs and most of the STUs have done well and this is a very successful model. And uh, the first one to come was Volvo, uh, followed by Scania, Mercedes-Benz and all. Today we have, you will not even understand whether it is operated by a private operator or a public transport bus. It's all the color is same, the discipline, the ticketing, you will not even find out what it is. Like Maharashtra is operating on that, Himachal has been operating, Uttra, Uttarakhand is operating, UP is operating on that, uh, Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra, of course, um, Rajasthan have been operating on this and this is a very successful model. And when you ask this question whether we can really work with this place like Ola, Yes, why not? In fact, I have seen personally the Ola shuttle in Delhi, sir. I think it's a very successful model. In fact, we have spare capacity. I was talking to my STUs, especially in urban areas like BMTC and other places, and even BST. We have the capacity to operate the tarmac buses also. We have spare capacity. I was talking to DTC also. So this is how the revolutionary change took place in the railway way back about six, seven years back when they really made these coaches for maintenance uh, a little longer and could see more productivity. This is where we also look at an opportunity. So if we can improve our productivity in terms of our rolling stock or manpower and also add the quantities with the partners like Ola or the private operators who can bring in these numbers to us, I think we can answer the question and be the most efficient public transport system. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, I think I'll open the floor for the question answer, so you can raise the question. Somebody can give the mic, please. You can directly address to the panelist also, or if it's a general question, you can. Yeah. Uh, the most critical f success factor in electrical vehicles is lithium battery. And lithium batteries are, cost is reducing at the rate of 30, 25%, 30%. But uh, from the panel discussion, it doesn't seem that we are working on, you know, attacking the lithium batteries. But once we are able to attack the lithium batteries, because we have very good knowledge about lithium batteries, this, uh, you know, that Space Research Institute is already working on that. So rather than depending on foreigners who send us ba batteries and we assemble it here, so we are playing in the hands of foreigners. So why don't we work on the most critical success factor, which is lithium batteries, so that we are more able to control the prices of electrical vehicles? That. You're absolutely right. The, the biggest part of the electric vehicle cost is the battery and one needs to work on it. 30% reduction. Sure. So uh, ISRO's chemistry is what you know, is being assessed very, uh, you know, very systematically and thoroughly to break that into an automotive grade product. See, uh, ISRO's chemistry was designed to have a life of 25 years, handle 1100 G-force, right? Uh, you know, buses are a very harsh environment, but we don't go that far, right? So, uh, so there is some amount of engineering work which has to be done to make it viable, 
and realistic in India. There are other companies who are also getting into lithium battery manufacturing, not just assembly, but cell manufacturing in the country. And I think uh, there are uh, projects which have been done under CSIR to identify an alternate to the lithium as well. Lithium production has a fairly high amount of toxic byproduce. So one has to be very careful when looks at lithium and there are other kind of, you know, which are medium to long term projects which will bring, you know, replacement to lithium altogether. Uh, the point is, do we wait for all of that to happen or we pick what we get and then optimize as we go forward? I think that's the decision one has to take. They have a regular supply of lithium for the next 30 years. But Indian government, nobody seems to be bothered. In fact, I tweeted to Prime Minister also. I said, why yeah, don't we uh, do something about that? Yeah. So, any other question? Yeah, I, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay, please. Yeah. Um, hi, um, we are from Prime Rail Infralabs. Um, we are a company based in Bangalore. Uh, we are developing a uh, personal rapid system. It's basically an e bike system. Uh, so, I have a general question um, to. Uh, any one of you can answer that for me. Um, you talked about uh, an OEM manufacturer um, uh, and that the prices of uh, per kilometer uh, was uh, was not different. I mean, it was the same for the electric vehicle and for the uh, normal buses. Um, how uh, you, you know the electric vehicles are heavily subsidized at the moment, and uh, uh, the the normal buses are not. How sustainable do you think is uh, is this form of transport? I mean, this mechanism in the, for the future, how sustainable yeah. it is. Yeah, there are two aspects to this when we work out the cost. In fact, when we talk of diesel and CNG buses, we have taken the life of five to seven years. When we talk of electric buses, we have taken the life of 10 to 12 years. So that's where the cost is distributed over a period. And I think he had a very uh, valid question, if I'm, though not from the industry, out of interest. And we had a couple of uh, such interactions with the industry and the stakeholders, your point is very valid. I was in discussion with the CEO of BMTC, the MD, just last week. This question was also asked to me when I was talking about the cost. He said the cost of batteries are going to come down year on year. So have you built in that factor in your taking of the cost over a 10 or 12 year period? That's very important. I think you made a point there. So we have to account to that cost reduction over a period of seven, eight or 10 years into our cost now only. Because as Chinmay was saying that we are talking of diesel for the next seven years. We are talking of battery for, generally we talk of replacement of battery for six to seven years. As of now, it could be more. But on the cost aspect, as he, as he has rightly pointed out, I think it's going to come down and we are going to factor on this also, as you said. And these are some of the cost components which we would like to add. And we have two types of charging. I don't know if the panel was able to discuss or the other presenters have made this on the lithium ion phosphate battery and the lithium ion titanate battery. So that's going to the future if Chinmay can add value to this because he's from the research and industry background. Uh, we are looking of these two options. The slow charging will be with lithium ion phosphate batteries and the fast charging could be with lithium ion titanate batteries. Right, then he also made a point on the weight of the batteries. We have to strike a balance and also see whether we are going to carry more passengers or more batteries and more range. So this is where we are uh, now at a proper stage so we'll be able to answer. More or less we are, we had uh, at least six to eight round of uh, discussion, stakeholder dialogue with us. I'm going to have one more in Bangalore in the next week around 15th. So where we'll have the industry, we have the battery manufacturers, we have the research, we have the operators and even our SDUs who are the stakeholders to this. And we probably try to answer all these type of questions. I hope I have answered your point. Thanks. Yeah, of course, uh, to add to this, yes, it is with subsidy. We have taken the subsidy into cost here of the DHI subsidy when I'm talking of the cost. And the subsidy is not given at one go for the information of the audience and this August gathering. It is spread over three installments, year one, year two, year three. It is in 30, 30, 35% year on year. So that we have built up into the year on year subsidy grant that is given by DHI. Of course, uh, Metro is totally a different system. In fact, I also speak in different forums. The 
cost of funding one kilometer of metro is given to a city like any city, we can run almost 300 to 500 buses in a city. Uh, so that is the uh, volume and cost of a metro which we cannot compare and also the sustainability and the amount of infrastructure is, that is pumped into metro is something which is totally different. Uh, okay. so, uh, can you use the mic please? Uh, yeah. Uh, when we compare diesel vehicles versus electric vehicles, today diesel vehicles, uh, it is being run on diesel and diesel is a lot of tax government is putting. That tax is being used for the building of the public infrastructure like roads and whatever required for the yeah, yeah. run the vehicles. When electric vehicles, tomorrow we switch out to electric vehicles, the cost of public infrastructure, whatever to be funded, that has to come from the vehicles. That is again it's going to go for electric vehicles, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So In that fact, cost there are two components to this. I don't know if we have touched on this. The government is also funding one is on the infrastructure, that is the charging infrastructure. 10% of the electric bus is built into this uh, towards the charging infrastructure additionally, beyond the subsidy that is given. So that is one part that is given by the central government on the subsidy front. As you said rightly, there could be other sources of uh, uh, system because now with the GST we cannot add too much of our own uh, things because it is all centrally controlled. States have no I mean, access or uh, you know what they can add to uh, on infrastructure cost, so it has to be addressed by the center and by the G GST committee in the panel only, I would say. So I don't have to say much on this, probably we may have to wait and see. And just okay. take the last Just question. Uh, last question from the entrepreneurship. Uh, there are a lot of people who really want to get into this segment of electric buses and vehicles. And uh, once you try to get into the domain of B2C, you need to have a larger expertise you need to have a larger scale of investment. On the same side, if you want to invest on a B2B segment of transportation, maybe with electric vehicles, there's a lot of hindrance coming from government in terms of contract carriage permits and all those things because parallelly what they say is that there's a straight government loss in revenue. So that's one point I think uh, to build up private entrepreneurship, government needs to give that leverage in operating, especially in the B2B space initially and then making it on a larger scale on B2C. Looking at the investment model and uh, operational challenges also can be well controlled and a very positive feel can go across and a lot of people can come on this. That's my point on this. Anybody? I think uh, you can, the panel, you can separately discuss with them because we are already running a short of time uh, ahead of uh, schedule. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your present, taking out time. And uh, I think it was really learning for me, uh, having a different uh, perspective from industry, from uh, technology operator, from STUs, from charging, and from advocacy. So it's really a nice uh, group to learn the different perspective. Thank you so much for your presence and uh, for the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jonas, and the stage. Thank you.